Well, hello everyone. This is Philip Shields. We're continuing our series. This is really pr probably a two-part series on the Sabbath day. Today is going to be about the practical ways we keep it and um, keep it holy before God. And uh, I hope, I really hope you will take the time to really study part one where the scriptures about how important the Sabbath is, which day of the week it is, and the things God says to do on the Sabbath and not do on the Sabbath. He says we are to stop. That's what Shabbat means. Sabbath means stop. And rest, Sabbaton, Sabbat Sabbaton means to rest, assemble. We are to Leviticus 23, come together and worship God. We are not to do any work, and we are to keep it holy. If you hear any thunder, that's what, that's what the noise in the background. And a few other things. So God did not, though, give a host of very specific do's and don'ts. He didn't say you can pick up this much weight, but not more than that. He didn't say um, he, he didn't say you can walk this far, but no further. Uh, he, he just didn't give a lot of specifics. So when the one who created the Sabbath, the one who was Lord of the Sabbath, the one who was there with Adam and Eve, which was the one who became Jesus Christ or Yeshua, is his given Hebrew name, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, same person, okay? Uh, he was considered by the Jews of his day to be very, very liberal compared to what they believed and, and taught. Now, so I see even today a lot of people who are either very liberal on the Sabbath, maybe a lot more than I am even, and, and, or who are a lot tougher than I am even. And some of you will think I'm really tough in some areas. Some of you will think I'm very liberal in some area. But anyway, so because of the fact that God did not give them a, a list clear-cut list and definitions of do's and don'ts. The Jews, some hundred, some few hundred years after Christ, came up with a list of their own. And that's all in the, the Talmud, which takes in the Gemara and the Mishnah. And they put it all there together. And, and there they explain all the different verses and all the different debates that the different rabbis had with each other. We're not going to, we're going to try not to do that. God didn't do it. I shouldn't do it. But there will be questions that I'll bring up, and I will sh share with you, uh, much to my reluctance to do so, what we do. Please don't judge me if you think I'm really totally wrong on something. Go ahead and write me if you want. Um, if you think it's been helpful to you, let me know that as well. So I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of Light on the Rock. Uh, please use this site uh, fully. Let's go to the home page, lightontherock.org. At the very top, you'll see video. Click on that, and you'll see all the videos, video sermons, all listed, in, you know, one by one, I believe they are. And then go to audio, and same thing there. And both video and audio will have notes. The notes are not word for word, but are almost word for word. I just don't have the time to do the notes word for word. Myself, I just don't. I don't have secretaries and all of that. I just don't. But you'll find the notes helpful. They will have all the scriptures. They'll have my comments. And then the blogs are short articles. I think you'll find those helpful as well. And um, please feel free to... Uh, it, it lifts us up in the YouTube rankings and Vimeo and all that. If you will like a, a sermon or blog, or if you will mention some kind of comment or list some kind of comment. Anyway, so we're going to avoid the Talmud approach. Uh, they regulated all the joy out of the Sabbath. They really did. And you'll see what Yeshua says as we go through. Today's sermon is part two. And I hope you'll find Sabbath a joy, much more of a joy and liberating and feel more confident about it. But in the end, you may have to at times... Uh, if, if you, especially if you don't agree with my suggestions, that you take it before God in prayer and do what your conscience allows you to do. That which is not of faith is sin. Remember that. So, uh, but don't judge others either. But if you have comments on the Sabbath and the comments on what I'm saying here, I, I'd love to hear from you. Anyway, so last time we mentioned how God himself proclaimed the seventh day, not one in seven, as so many want to say, he didn't say one in seven. He said the seventh day is holy. I'm stopping my work. I'm resting. I'm putting my presence to make it holy on this day and this day only, the seventh day, as far as the weekly Sabbath goes. 
just that day. It wasn't Sunday. It wasn't Friday. It wasn't first or sixth day or fourth or third day. And it was always the seventh day. It wasn't lunar moon calendar stuff where it could be any other day uh, at some time. No, it is one. It's not one in seven. It's the seventh day. Then there's no stated authority in the, given in the Bible to change it for any reason. God nowhere says that, okay, now that we all believe how Christ was resurrected on Sunday morning, frankly, he wasn't. That's a different topic. He would be three days and three nights in the tomb, and they put him inside the tomb just before sundown of the holy day about to start. Not the Friday and Saturday, Friday night, but the holy day, first day of unleavened bread. And my point is it was just before sundown. For Jesus to be our Savior, the only sign he gave, three days and three nights in the tomb, would have been that he was resurrected the night before. And by Sunday morning, first day of the week, while it was still dark, John 20 says, they found it already empty. So it doesn't say he was resurrected then. He was, had already been resurrected by that point. Okay? So anyway, so keep that in mind. And so God does say, I want you to remember this day, the seventh day, my, my Sabbath day, my holy day. He says, remember it. So what does Christianity, uh, Protestants and Catholics and everybody else, what do they all want to say? Forget it. Forget it. You don't need to keep the Sabbath. Or you don't need to keep it on the seventh day. Forget it. God says, remember it. I'm going to go with what God says. How about you? So anyway, let's make a conscious effort to make the Sabbath day special. It's not like any other day of the week. Let's make sure it doesn't appear or feel like any other day of the week. And try not to be talking idle talk and all of that. We're going to see some of that more in Isaiah 58. Hebrews 4, verse 9, very important verse. There remains a Sabbath day for God's people to keep. Hebrews 4, verse 9. And I think one thing you'll find interesting, this is new, I didn't, I didn't talk about this last time. After each day of creation, as God finished a certain thing, when God brought light, the evening and the morning was the first day. And then the second day, the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. There's no such statement about the seventh day. And the evening and the morning was the seventh day. You won't find it in Genesis 2. It's not there. Because I think it might mean that God is intending this Sabbath rest not to be finished, but to go on. There remains a Sabbath day rest for the people of God, Hebrews 4, 9. And those who say Jesus is their rest, Jesus is their Sabbath, in a way I don't have a problem with that. He's my rest too. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Right, Matthew, what is that? Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me if you're heavily burdened, I'll give you rest. I will give you rest. But was he canceling the Sabbath then? No, he had said in Matthew 5 that until heaven and earth pass away, I will by no means cancel even one little dot, one little point in the law. I just won't. Okay, so now when we come to God, we're also saying to him as we keep Sabbath, Father in heaven, I am by keeping your Sabbath, your stop day, your rest day, I'm showing you my desire to stop my own works. Stop my own works and do your rest and do your works. Anyway, so let's go into real practical terms. What if you have an unbelieving mate? What if there's a graduation or a funeral? Um, should you be able to go out to restaurants on the Sabbath? Uh, can you make love to your husband or wife on the Sabbath? Better be your husband or wife, right? Or is that seeking your own pleasure, like Isaiah 58 talks about not doing? Or is it maybe work? <laughs> we'll talk about it, okay? So anyway, let's go to John 5. Let's get some real good, solid working principles from the Lord of the Sabbath himself. John 5, Jesus had just healed a man on the Sabbath and told him to pick up his bed, his probably rattan mat or maybe extra clothes, laying down on the ground. And Pharisees thought that was work to pick up anything heavier than the weight of a fig. 
And so they were really upset that Yeshua had said, pick up your mat. So they felt that he had broken the Sabbath. But remember, breaking any of God's commandments is sin. If Jesus had broken the Sabbath, he would have sinned. He could not have been our Savior. Right? He would have had to die for his own sin. So last time we, we talked about, we'll talk more about that in a second. Stop, rest, and remember your Creator. We'll talk about and we'll look about how Jesus kept the Sabbath and examples and lessons from that. We'll talk about in Genesis 2, very crucial point I'm about to give. I did not mention this last time. Somebody told one of the people that I speak with, he used to believe in Sabbath, but he no longer does. Because you see, he says, wrongly, he says, the Sabbath and what was, was added, like all the other laws, the Sabbath was added because of transgression. And he quotes Galatians 3.19. The law was added because of transgression, he says. Well, what transgression? My immediate retort is, what transgression? When God created the Sabbath the day after Adam and Eve were created, they hadn't sinned yet. Nobody on earth had sinned yet. No humans had. Satan had, but not, not any man, not any human. No man or woman had sinned. So it could not, you cannot say the Sabbath was added because of transgression. Anyway, people start saying things like that and don't think it through. Isaiah 58, we'll post it now, speaks of making the Sabbath a delight. Not a big burden. Not a thing where you think, oh, what time is it now? When, when's Sabbath going to be over? If you have that attitude, and there are times I've had it over the 50 years or more that I've kept Sabbath, 60 years or more that I've kept Sabbath. I, um, you know, that's, that shows that our heart's not right. We're not understanding Sabbath. We're not keeping Sabbath correctly. If we have that attitude, I think that's in Amos where it says, when will Sabbath be over? I think it's Amos 8, verse 5. Amos 8, verse 5. I'll, if that's not right, right, I'll put it in the notes. But Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, don't step on my Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day. Isaiah 58, 13. Call the Sabbath a delight. If it's not a delight, something's wrong. The holy day of Jehovah, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. What does all that mean? Well, in the International Standard Version, God goes on to say in verse 14, if you do all that, I will bless you. Okay, verse 14, 13 again, Isaiah 58, 13 again. This time out of the International Standard Version. Not NIV, but a different one. International Standard Version. Listen to this now. If you keep your feet from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight, and the Lord's holy day honorable. And if you honor it by not going your own ways and seeking your own pleasure, not going your own ways, not seeking your own pleasure, or speaking merely idle words. Honor it. Don't do your own stuff. Don't do your own things on the Sabbath. So anyway, because he told this man to pick up his mat and walk, and he had healed him on the Sabbath, and... Uh, and then he talked about how God is still working and I'm working. Therefore, Jesus, I mean the Jews, the Jews sought to kill him all the more because he not only broke the Sabbath, they said, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal to God or equal with God. So you have John 5, 18, because he not only broke the Sabbath. Folks, that's it. If he broke the Sabbath, we have no Savior. He would have had to die for his own sin. He broke something all right, but what he broke were the what the Jews said you could and could not do on Sabbath. Has to be that. Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, In him who knew no sin, he knew no sin. 2 Peter 2.22 says he committed no sin. So he could not have broken the Sabbath. Breaking the Sabbath would be a huge sin. 
he broke Jewish traditions. So it's very important what Jesus brought to us is common sense about God's Sabbath. He wanted us to get the joy back in it. I think he purposely did things that broke their traditions so that a record could be made that this is what the Lord of the Sabbath actually said and did on his Sabbath. The Jews were making it a joyless day, the, the Orthodox Jews of his day, the Pharisees. So let's go back and understand some other things here. In Mark 2, verse 27 and 28, let's post it up there. He explained that the Sabbath day, this is Yeshua speaking, was made for our benefit. The Sabbath was made to serve us. He puts it simply by saying the Sabbath was made for man. I'll say it this way, the Sabbath was created to serve us. Not us created to serve the Sabbath. Getting this point is crucial to finding your right balance to having a joyful, holy, kept, obediently kept Sabbath. Let me say this too. Consciously breaking the Sabbath is as bad a sin as killing somebody. Breaking the Sabbath and idolatry were two of the worst things that God said they got involved in why he had to send them out of the land, out of, out of Palestine, out of Canaan, out of the Holy Land. Getting this point established in your heart will be a key. The Sabbath was made for us, to serve us, not us to serve Sabbath. What was the context of that? That particular verse in Mark 2, the context was about them walking through grain fields. We'll read it in a minute. I'm going to move to Matthew 12. I wanted to get the wording in Mark 2, 27. The Sabbath was made for man. Then he calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. I know what I'm talking about. He says, I made it. I created it. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So don't tell me what I can and can't do on the day I created to be holy and a joyful delight. That's what he's saying. So let's go back to Matthew 12. Same story, a little more detailed though. Now remember as we go there that Exodus 34.21, Exodus 34.21 says that you are not to break the Sabbath, you're, you're to keep the Sabbath in plowing and harvesting season. You're to rest, do no work in plowing or harvesting. So not, you're not allowed to harvest. So you've got 30 acres or 40 acres, 100 acres of wheat. You're not allowed to go out with your combine or your scythe, or, you know, your sickles and everything and, and harvest. But look what happened. Matthew 12, verses 1 to 4. This tells us a lot about how to keep Sabbath. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields, not corn. They didn't have corn. It was grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Just pluck the grain, rub them together hard, get some of the chaff off, toss them in your mouth. When the Pharisees, the Orthodox Jews, saw it, they were incensed. They said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Why? Because they could read Exodus 34, 21, keep the Sabbath even in harvest season. Don't be harvesting. But he said to them, that's not harvesting. They just got a few handfuls. That's not, the fields are still there. But he said to them, have you not read? what David did when he was hungry, when he was hungry. And the story we're about to read about David also probably occurred on the Sabbath, when the bread, the showbread of the presence, the showbread in the tabernacle, was changed every Sabbath. So they did some baking, obviously, on the Sabbath to be able to change it on the Sabbath. But anyway, but David, uh, it probably happened on Sabbath. That's when the bread was changed out. When he was hungry, and this is God's anointed, he was hungry, he had some people with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful. He broke the law for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, only for the priest to eat. The disciples must have been pretty hungry to be going through the grain fields and chucking wheat in their mouth. Yeshua gave the example of David. 
and, the, and eating the priest's bread, which only they were allowed to eat. That story is in 1 Samuel 21. I recommend you take the time to read the chapter. Uh, obviously, David, frankly, even lied. He told the priest, I forget his name now, but he told the priest, I'm here on special business from the king, which was nonsense. He was fleeing from the king. And so anyway, he got uh, not only bread, but he got Goliath's sword. He said, there's none like it. I'd love to have it. And then Doeg, who was the guy watching the mules, uh, he was uh, the chief uh, over, overseer of the, of the uh, people watching the animals for, for Saul. He watched all this and reported it. And the end result was 85 priests were killed by Doeg. Not just them, but their wives, their kids. All their property was destroyed. This was very costly what happened here. You can read Isaiah, uh, I mean Psalm 52, where David talks about it. Psalm 52. And the verse about the uh, bread being changed out on the Sabbath is Leviticus 24, verses 5 to 9. And, and make sure you read that account in 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6. Under the circumstances, the Lord of the Sabbath, Yeshua, Jesus, is saying, He was my anointed king that I had anointed. He was hungry, famished. Of course he can have some bread that normally is for the priests. Now that's where you and I think, well, wait a minute. You either have a law or you don't have a law. Yeshua says many places, I'd rather have mercy rather than sacrifice. So let's read Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 12, verse 5 now. Or have you not read in the law? That was a little bit of a slap in the face. They did nothing but read the law. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? Of course they do. They have to offer sacrifices. They have to have a fire going. They have to cook the sacrifice. They have to make sure the lights are all going on 24-7. The menorah. I want you to rem remember that when we talk about lighting no fire and all those things. They were cooking on Sabbath, baking bread. He says, the Sabbath, the, the priests in the temple profane it, but are blameless because that's what they were, they had to do to fulfill their role. So let me just say right now, those of you who are ministers, who are traveling, who are speaking, who are working on the Sabbath, and it, uh, when I did that, I, I was dead tired by Sabbath evening. Find another day to be your day of rest. Keep the principle, you guys who have to work in church-related services, keep the principle of resting one day in seven, but the rest of us, we keep the seventh day. So he says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Verse 7, If you had known what it means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned my guiltless disciples. He's talking about his disciples here. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So don't condemn my disciples. I know what we're doing here. So now, when you ministers take another day to stop and rest, be sure on the Sabbath that you're not so into your own speaking and preaching and teaching and all those things that you have your flock in church services pretty much all day long that's not keeping the Sabbath stop, rest. Sure, you did the worship thing, which was added in Leviticus 23. It wasn't part of the original fourth commandment. It wasn't part of what was in Genesis 2. But the main thing God wants is stop, rest. Yeah, remember your creator. Let your church have a break. Let them sleep in. Do you really think small children and teens look forward to being in church all day long? We lose a lot of our kids and teens, you know. I think that might be part of it. It's to be a joy and a delight for them, too. I know when, one area where I served, I had three churches, and I would go to two of them every Sabbath. So I'd alternate, I'd say two out of three every Sabbath. I'd always come back to my home church, so they got me there every Sabbath. And initially, I took my kids with me, my wife and my two little toddler kids. 
and one would always throw up in the car. What a delight. <laughs> so, and it was a long drag for them, frankly, to sit through a long drive, two hour drive to services, give the sermon, listen to dad talk, listen to dad counsel with people afterwards, have a quick meal, get back in the car for another two hour drive, and then another service. So I finally just said, no, I'll just do it. And you and the kids, I said to my wife, you stay home. It's got to become a joy and a delight for the whole family. A time when the kids can and, 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 and the church people have time to even nap or go to the park or play with the kids or do their own study, okay? So now, um, Matthew 12, verses 9 to 14, when he departed from there, he went into a synagogue. Behold, there's a man there with a withered hand, whatever that means, just no hand there. And they asked him, one other account says he asked them, so probably asking each other, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And in the account, I think it's in Mark 3, uh, he's quite upset with them because of their hard heart. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep, and it, this one sheep they have, falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Or how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to heal, lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, verse 13, and was restored as whole as the other. And the Pharisees were so upset that this man got healed on the Sabbath that they went out and plotted against him how they might kill him, destroy him. So here's another great guideline from the Lord of the Sabbath. It's okay to work on Sabbath when there's an emergency like a sheep that's fallen in the pit and when you're able to do some good to save life, that's fine. So if you're going someplace and you find out your neighbor runs over and says, oh, Philip, I've got I've to do this urgently, but I found out my tire is flat. I have no idea how to change a flat tire. Can you help me? Now, I might ask her if she's part of AAA, and if she is, that she might consider calling AAA. But if I can help her with it, I certainly would, uh, especially if she had something truly important to have to do. Um, do good on the Sabbath. If there's been a hurricane, a tidal wave, tornado, earthquake, whatever, flash floods, and helpers are needed, badly needed, to dig people out, to help people, to bring food for them. By all means, I hope your whole church will be there on the Sabbath, working hard to do good on the Sabbath. I hope your whole congregation understands that. We're supposed, of course, to prepare for the Sabbath. So if you see a pit there and you've got a sheep that's been playing around this pit, well, of course, you tie the sheep up or put it in a keep somewhere away from that pit but unforeseen circumstances, Jesus calls us sheep in the pit or an ox in the ditch. And in these situations, do what work is necessary and do your best, though, not to be caught off guard on the Sabbath. Be prepared. If you run out of baby formula, you really thought you had a bunch, but you didn't. And your baby badly needs some baby formula. You can't breastfeed her. It's been too long. Uh, go buy the baby formula. But if on Thursday and Friday you see you're, you're low on baby formula, don't, don't wait till Sabbath. Plan better. Filling up your car with gas on the way to church services shows you're not prepared for Sabbath. On the other hand, if you truly, truly did forget this time and you see it's on empty, oh no, how did I let that happen? And you do want to make it services, you don't want to run out of gas halfway, halfway there, go ahead, but don't let that happen again. Be prepared. Another time Yeshua was criticized for healing a woman with a, had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, bowed over way bad, I, real badly, I gave a whole sermon on spirit of infirmity. They were criticizing him for healing on the Sabbath. And the head of the synagogue even said, okay, all of you, if you want to get healed, come on some other day, but not on Sabbath. You can't get healed on Sabbath. That's work. <laughs> so Luke 13, verses 15 to 17 the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath loose his ox 
or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it. So ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from her bond? You're going to loose the bond on an ox or a donkey or something who wants water. Can I not loose the bond on this woman who's been suffering for 18 years? And when he'd said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him, through him, and so on. So yes, we can do good things on the Sabbath. <laughs> There's some work we have to do. If you're a dairy farmer, you have to still milk the cows. I believe you do anyway. Tell me if I'm wrong. But I believe even dairy farmers still have to get up early and milk their cows. Give water as needed. I have a couple of pots, potted plants that seem to need water every day. Um, I have tried holding it off till end of Sabbath to get some water at the end of the day. But I've given them a little bit of water, just a dab. You know, just pour the little jug of water, give it a dab on the Sabbath. I don't think I'm breaking any law. So the Sabbath was made to serve me, to serve you. The bigger point is, yes, release burdens on the Sabbath. Now, this question always comes up. What if your job is to be a nurse, an RN, or a fireman, firefighter, or an EMT, the emergency ambulance guys? Um, why can't I think of what it stands for? EMT, emergency something. All I could think was electromagnetic, and that's not it, is it? <laughs> but anyway, your job as a nurse, a policeman, police uh, officer, firefighter, EMT. If it's your full-time job, I really, really think you need to keep the Sabbath holy. You need to ask, especially here in America, where we have in the constitutional right, to not have to break our religious beliefs, but to worship as we believe, and that that right should not be infringed. Now, if you've been working on Sabbath and then come to understand that Sabbath is the day that you need to rest now, uh, it might be a little harder, but you need to understand, explain to them, I've come to this new belief and have your scriptures ready and everything else. Offer to work extra time other days to take other people's days off as long as it's not Saturday or Sabbath. Explain that willingness. And if worse comes to worse, contact ACLJ. Now, Scott, let's put that up, aclj.org. And uh, they have helped Sabbath keepers, even though they're more of a Protestant uh, foundation or group, American Civil Liberties or Civil, whatever it all means, aclj.org. But when there's a, a real unforeseen emergency and you're a nurse, a firefighter, a police, an EMT, by all means, get out there. Work it. Work it on the Sabbath. If there's been, uh, if there's been uh, flash floods, like recently, fire, uh, terrible fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and they need you as a nurse out there, police officer out there, firefighter out there, on these special unforeseen emergencies, be out there. And the rest of us should be out there too if we can help. Not a problem. The Sabbath was made to serve us. What about buying and selling on the Sabbath? Exchanging money on the Sabbath? The answer is not in the fourth commandment. It's not in Genesis 2, Exodus 16. It's not in any of those. But you can see the principle taught to us by Nehemiah. He was a uh, governor, a leader that came back. Uh, I don't know if he was governor, but he came back to, uh, from Babylon after the 70 years and was trying to rebuild Jerusalem's walls in Jerusalem itself. And Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 22. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. So they're obviously making wine on the Sabbath. And bringing in sheaves, loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens. So a burden was defined as the weight of a fig, okay, by the... Orthodox Jews, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling, exchanging money, selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also. They brought in fish, all kinds of stuff. And they sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah 
and in Jerusalem. I contended with the nobles of Judah, verse 17. And I said to them, okay, in Nehemiah 13, 17, What evil thing is this you do by which you profane, you break, you make unholy, okay? You profane the Sabbath day. Isn't this what our fathers did? And didn't God bring all this disaster on us in our city? Yet you added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. What's he saying? He's saying in his judgment, bringing in all these burdens, uh, treading wine presses, buying and selling on the Sabbath, was profaning it, breaking it. So it was, at the, as the gates, verse 19, Nehemiah 13, 19, as the gates at Jerusalem began, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath at the gates of Jerusalem, I commanded the gates to be shut, and I charged that they must not be opened till after the Sabbath. And I even posted guards there at the gates. Remember it says to keep the Sabbath. And one of the meanings of keep is guard it. You put your sheep in a keep. So that's what he did. Now, those guards, they were in a way working, weren't they? But he says, this. again, the principle is I want my people here to not buy and sell on the Sabbath and not trade in commerce, not be trading wine presses. So I'm going to put guards out here to make, make sure this, this, this stops. Then some decided to lodge there, and he said, stop doing that, or I'm going to arrest you. Okay? Verse 22, the end of it. So they put, he put some there to guard the gates. Verse 22, to guard the gates, to sanctify, set it apart as the stop day, as the Sabbath means stop day. So how do we apply that today? Well, I'll tell you what we do, what we don't do. We do our best to avoid an exchanging of money on the Sabbath. So we do not eat out on the Sabbath. We have gone out to eat Friday late afternoon before sundown. Pay it and everything before sundown. Uh, but we don't go out Saturday morning or we don't go out Saturday afternoon for lunch. We don't go out to a brunch IHOP. We do not. We avoid going out when we're home. Mr. Armstrong used to explain something here too though, that when we're away, this was his judgment. When we're away from home and trying to obey God, especially like at the Feast of Tabernacles, or at a Sabbath service that you had to drive to, or maybe a combined services or something someplace, not in the usual place. In these away situations, he felt it would be okay to go out to restaurants and buy your lunch. A lot of people still would prefer to pack a lunch in that case. But I'm saying this was a judgment he made. So at the Feast of Tabernacles, many of the people I attend with, probably most of the people I attend with, do go out on the holy days. And remember, by the way, the holy days, except for atonement, were not as strict as the Sabbath. The holy days, you were allowed to cook, for example, very clearly specified, you're allowed to cook. So if you feel better packing a lunch, taking your cooler with you, and having sandwiches ready and all that, all, by all means, do it. But please don't judge, condemn others who decide to go to a restaurant. I think we're going to try our best to avoid, even in away situations, uh, people invite you out, you know, on the first holy day at the feast, on the eighth day of the feast. What about tolls and parking fees? I know people who will drive way out of their way to avoid having to pay any fees so what we do is we have a prepaid pass. We just zoom right through. We don't stop. We don't have to get our wallet out. We don't have to exchange money. I'm saying if you have to be at services someplace or the feast or someplace of keeping the Sabbath and involves toll roads, there's so many here in Florida, we don't stop. We never take our money, wallet out, and all of that. We just zoom through. People say, well, you're still paying. I guess we are, but so are you. When you have your lights on on the Sabbath, are you not generating a bill or a money owed, let's put it that way, by your lights being on the Sabbath, your air condition being on on the Sabbath, uh, anything like that that uses electricity, your fans or whatever. But you pay it on other days. And the same thing with um, your water bill. So the Sabbath was made to serve us, not to become a great big problem where you got to drive 50 miles out of your way, avoiding the toll highways, the faster highways, uh, just so you don't have to use that prepaid pass, which is no problem. You just zip right through. I'm never stopping 
to have to pull money out of a wallet and pay somebody at a, at a toll booth. I just zoom right through. Okay? Does that help you? I hope it does. What about having beautiful marital sex on the Sabbath? Now, no ugly marital sex. <laughs> just beautiful marital sex. Is having marital sex, again, marital, it's got to be someone you're married to, is that breaking the Sabbath? Well, it depends if you call it your pleasure or working. <laughs> Might be for some of you. Some of you, I don't know. The, but the Bible says, seriously here, Hebrews 13, verse 4, the marriage bed is honorable and undefiled. Adam and Eve were created naked and were not ashamed. Why should they be? But let's think about what happened here. Day six of creation. First, the animals were made. And then... After the animals were made, God made Adam outside the garden and then brought him into the garden. Okay? He made him outside and brought him in. That's in Genesis 2. Eve was not created yet, but God showed him the two trees, showed Adam the two trees so he'd be the leader and show that to Eve. That's what Paul says in one of his epistles, I think in Timothy someplace. Um, and then he was asked to name the animals. God likes to see us be involved. I'm thinking of giving a sermon at the feast about how much God likes to see us get involved. And he loved seeing what Adam would come up with. And whatever he named that animal, uh, that's what he named him. Oh, there goes a, uh, there goes a flutterby. Uh, later that got corrupted to butterfly or what? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, by the end of all of that, surely we're now, the animals had been created first. Adam's created. The two trees are shown him. He has him named the animals, that must, be, that must have taken a long time. He didn't name them all because we're still trying to find and name some. And by the end of all of that, we're late afternoon. Eve isn't created yet. But wasn't God smart to give Adam a job first? Think about this. Imagine expecting Adam to get any work done if God had first brought out this beautiful, young, naked woman <laughs> for Adam and then said try to name the animals uh, he'd be distracted I could see God saying Adam hey hey I'm talking to you look over here I'm talking to you Adam look at me you all understand right <laughs> we guys and you girls too and then what happened after Eve was created God told them together they would be have dominion over the earth that's at the end of Genesis 1, verses 26 to 31. And then Creator says to them in verse 28, Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and God, now remember, this is the day they're created. It's end of Friday now. It's end of the sixth day. And they're both naked. <laughs> and God said to them, be fruitful. Can I translate that? Have some kids, a lot of them. And multiply, fill the earth. Lots of them. Fill the earth, subdue it. Tradition says they had 60 kids, 30 girls, 30 boys. But have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, God brings Eve to Adam. No clothes. He's tired. And he says, now, before you do anything here, I want you to know I want you to be fruitful. Multiply. Here's another clue what could have happened at the end of the sixth day into the Sabbath. Genesis 2, verses 24 to 25. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, be joined, joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The whole discussion here, multiply, become one flesh, at the end of the sixth day. It's about marital love. It's about sex. And they were both naked. So just make sure we got the point. They were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed. So what do you think they did? They were to be joined together, become one flesh. They were to multiply and fill the earth. Guess what they probably were doing? That evening, Friday evening, Sabbath Eve, beginning of Sabbath, and the next day. I'm absolutely confident to say they were having marital love. 
and it's fine. So, marital sex on the Sabbath is wonderful. And yes, children, teens, young people, I wanted them to hear this. God loves the right kind of sex in the right place. They should hear this too. Wives, do you want your husband to come to church on Sabbath with a great big whopping big smile on his happy face? Then you know what to do, right? <laughs> yes, even on the Sabbath. And men, it's the Sabbath. Make sure you do the same for your wife. Take time. You both enjoy it. Make sure she has a happy face as well. With that, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 to 5. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 to 5. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body. When was the last time you had this read in church? Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Let that really sink in. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body. The wife does. You're one flesh. You both own each other. Do not deprive one another except for consent, with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. The newer translations don't include fasting in there. They take it out. But King James, New King James has that in there. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Come together again so Satan doesn't tempt you. Because after a while that all builds up. The need for it builds up. Let's just be plain. So Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So when you come to services and you don't want your husband looking at the young women in there, or vice versa, do what I say here about Sabbath. I am sure Adam and Eve did that. So anyway, how long can you fast? He says you can keep each other apart for as long as you can fast. How long can you pray? Maybe a day, maybe two or three days, maybe two or three hours. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And that's usually it. Here's how one translation says it just the way it is. Reading verse 5, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, out of the contemporary English version. So don't refuse sex to each other unless you agree not to have sex for a little while in order to spend time in prayer. Then Satan won't be able to tempt you. Really understand that verse. Men need this. Women need this. Especially men need this. Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control from going so long since the last time. Don't deprive each other, it says. Don't, don't refuse sex to each other. Okay, that's what it says. So, even on Sabbath, if one really feels the need and should want to, by all means, do it. And ladies, if you have an unbelieving husband, especially you wives, should make especially a point to make to have wonderful marital love with him Friday night or Sabbath day, if that's what he wants. And I think he just might one day come to you and say, you know what, I think I really like your religion. <laughs> and you men do the same with an unbelieving wife. Spend extra time with her, listening to her, being with her, cuddling with her, taking your time to show you love her on the Sabbath. So next Sabbath, I hope all our married couples come to church happy with a big smile. Let's move on. Uh, two or three of you out there say, yeah, yeah, move on. Uh, the Bible is not shy about sex, so we shouldn't be either. So, and if you're unable to have sex for any reason, find some way to satisfy each other still somehow, some way within that marriage covenant. I hope you figure out what I mean. I hope you're getting the idea. 
All right, now let's move on. Unbeliever spouse situations. What if you have a mate, a husband or a wife, not, not converted, not, uh, an unbeliever, doesn't believe in Sabbath? How do you handle Sabbath situations with an unbelieving mate? Apply the points I've mentioned already. Keep your spouse happy. But you can't wreck, please don't wreck your marriage over the Sabbath. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, command to the wives, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. NIV says it that way. Submit to your own husbands as you would if it was the Lord himself. That's the way I would say it. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. If your unbelieving husband insists and wants, you say, honey, I really don't want to go out. It's, it's my Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath, and I really don't want to go out to dinner. Sun is set, and he really, really, really wants to try that new restaurant on a Friday night. He's paying for it. It's going to be his credit card. It's his decision. He's head of the house. He's making the decision. Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. And remember, God is all about loving each other, loving him, loving one another. It's all about showing mercy and not sacrifice. All the things we've read about, uh, you know, harvesting a few grains in your mouth on the Sabbath. Picking up small loads, your your mat, your your mat or whatever. Yeshua's trying to tell us it's made for you guys. Come on, don't blow it now. I were if I were a believing wife married to an unbelieving husband, wants to go out for dinner, he's paying for it. I do it. I obey the command to submit to my own husband in everything, as it says, unless it's just a flagrant violation of God's law. But if he's paying for it. And he's the one saying so. Don't wreck your marriage over that. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. 1 Peter 3, likewise wives. By the way, it says in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives just like Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. Sometimes it's hard to submit. Sometimes it's hard to love. We're called to do that, aren't we? 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, and also verse 7 in 1 Peter 3 is all about husbands honoring their wives. Likewise, wives, verse 1, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some aren't converted, even if some aren't believers, that's what he's saying here, even if some do not obey the word, they may be won. They may be won over without a word, without your gabbing, chattering, they may be won without a word, without your argument, by the conduct of the wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. That's why I know I'm right when I say that if your unbelieving husband insists he wants, he wants pork or he wants ham or he wants whatever, his decision, find a way. If you can resolve some kind of compromise that satisfies you both, That'd be better. <clears throat> but don't ruin your marriage over it. Verse 5, this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, calling him, saying yes, sir, to him. It's there in Scripture. Then the next verse, 7, says, Husbands, honor your wives. Consider their needs. Live with them with understanding, which means you have to listen. All right, so let's move on. For, be ready for Sabbath before it starts. This section is about how to make it special and holy. I like to have sacred music playing in the background, hymns and so on. <clears throat> if I had an unconverted husband, I'd still try to have a special dinner, maybe his favorite dinners, and make Sabbath special. Again, especially if it's not sundown yet when you're cooking and all that. Uh, we ourselves don't do the Judaism pre-Sabbath stuff of lighting two candles and then 
eating challah bread and saying Jewish Hebrew prayers that I don't understand that have gone on for centuries, millennia maybe, and the wine and all that. We just have a lovely dinner. In the summertime, we have a lovely dinner Friday night, end of the sixth day while it's still not Sabbath yet, so we can cook and have a beautiful dinner. In the winter time, then we'll have a lovely dinner after Sabbath when the sun sets a lot earlier. That's how we do it. We tidy up a little bit. We don't do dishes and all that on Sabbath, but we will tidy up, stack them, rinse them off maybe. Make it different. So I don't do the stuff I do the other days. I don't go play darts on the Sabbath with the other guys. We don't go shopping. We don't clean up the house. We don't do any yard work. We don't do any weeding. We don't do our our gym, our gym gymnasium kind of work. Um, as far as the TV being on, I start, as far as the TV being on, uh, generally best, just turn the TV off. You don't need that. That's what makes it like other days. I might watch a short newscast, especially if it's not even sundown yet, or part of a newscast, just make sure I haven't missed the fact that World War III has started or something big like that. But you can skip those two and just check your just check your uh, laptop for the latest news or whatever. In our home, we generally don't watch any movies on Sabbath unless it's about, especially if we have grandkids with us and they want to watch a creation video or a movie about uh, animals and creation that they can watch. Or maybe for us, it's a YouTube video about prophecy or something to do with the Bible. We might watch a little bit here and there, certainly Zoom for a service we would. Uh, plan something fun for the kids. You can Google Sabbath games for children. They have all kinds of them. We have a few for our grandkids. We generally would not let them play video games on the Sabbath. Never would they read Harry Potter on the Sabbath or any day. Uh, we have gone camping in the past. We'll go up there maybe Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and then camp through the Sabbath in God's beautiful creation. Absolutely, we would do that. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes I've heard ministers say you should not go to funerals or graduation of loved ones. That's breaking the Sabbath. I'm thinking, what? Your favorite aunt has died, your uncle has died, your wife has died, and there's a funeral or, or whatever, cousin or somebody has died, grandma, grandpa, and it's on the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made to serve us, not us to serve Sabbath. See, I'm using that over and over. And I want to honor grandpa, grandma, cousin, aunt, uncle, who's, who's died. The rest of the family will be there, and I'm not going to be there? No, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. In fact, last Sabbath, I went to a funeral of a loved neighbor here. And what did they do? They read scripture. They talked about uh, seeing her again. They had uh, eulogies and nice things and so forth. There was beautiful, uh, amazing grace song kind of songs. I did not break the Sabbath by going to her funeral. That's my feeling. You may feel differently. We sometimes have had, with the job I used to have, they would send us to Europe. I remember in Barcelona and different other cities we were in, they would have this, the opening night was a big greet and meet and greet night. And they had nice hors d'oeuvres and all the wine you could drink and everything else flowing, food and water, okay? Very nice. And... Almost always it would be a Friday night, or Friday afternoon into the evening. So I would go for the before Sabbath period, meet all the dignitaries who were there and the heads of our company so they knew I was there. I would eat a couple of the uh, food hors d'oeuvres. Then I would excuse myself, maybe 15, 20 minutes before Sabbath started, I would excuse myself and go back to my room. And I don't think anybody noticed that I wasn't there the rest of the night. I, I made sure I met a lot of people. <laughs> they saw me there, but not on Sabbath. And then for the Saturday morning, Sabbath morning um, activities, if there were any that were business related, other than the meal, I would go to the meal. Uh, but if it was business related, um, 
I would ask for permission not to go and to tell them because of my Sabbath beliefs. They had to honor it. And so that's what we did. Now, graduation, again, hopefully you can go if it's in the summertime and sundown's late. You might be able to get through just about most of the graduation and then leave a little early. Or even if you were there, let's say the graduation was a Saturday late morning or something. I would pray hard about it, follow my conscience. I probably would go if it was for my own children and uh, explain to them that this is such an honor and the Sabbath was made for, for man. Uh, we'll, we'll do this and we'll go home and we'll do a lot of prayer and study and all that and, and pray that God forgive you if you got it wrong. Okay? Is it a sin? You may, a lot of you may disagree with a graduation one. How about a funeral? I don't know. I wouldn't mind your comments. Uh, a funeral of loved one? I definitely would be there. Is it a sin to ever skip Sabbath services? Leviticus 23, you shall have a holy convocation. Meeting with brethren to worship God should be a joy. Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, don't be like some who uh, forsake the assembling of themselves together. So don't be making this a, a frequent thing if you can help it, if you have no way of being at services because you're just so far away and every, every, everywhere else is a Sunday church or whatever. Sometimes you can't go to the big meeting. Sometimes you're sick. Sometimes the government says, if you go, we're going to arrest you like they were in some states here. Remember, Jesus said, if two or three of you gather in my name, that's enough. I will be there. Matthew 18, 20. That is a holy convocation. Two or three. My wife and I make two. So sometimes we can't go to the big meetings and it's not wrong to skip a big meeting service if sometimes you have other reasons why you just simply cannot go or you just need a break. Now, when Elijah had to stay out of sight for three years during the drought that God called him to pronounce, I'm sure Ahab and his wife were hunting for him, wanting him dead. When he was in hiding, being fed by ravens, so you know he was in hiding, being fed by ravens. You can read the story in 1 Kings 17, the first nine verses. Do you think he went openly to synagogue services all the time? No, I think not. 1 Kings 17. It kind of duplicates itself again in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 18, he calls down fire from heaven. He stops the drought and he kills 450, I think it was, priests of Baal, maybe 400 or 450. And then he ran ahead of his chariot, Ahab's chariot. Ahab tells Jezebel what he'd done. Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow, you will be a dead man. So he flees all the way to Mount Sinai. That's a many days journey, I'm sure. I'm sure he was in hiding for a while. I'm sure the whole time during the drought, the three years of drought, he was not going to church services. What about when Jesus fasted for 40 days? They have, you have at least five or six Sabbaths in that. So it's okay sometimes to stay home. It's okay sometimes to pray extra, fast, study, and so on. Is it okay to fast on the Sabbath? I've heard ministers say, Church of God ministers say, no, don't ever fast on the Sabbath because it's a feast day. What I could find, I didn't do a real thorough study on this, but where the Bible says it's a feast of the Lord about the Sabbath, the word there is moed, which means a divine appointment, a committed appointment time with God. The word for feast, as we think of feast, with lots of food and drink, dessert and all of that, the word there is hak, C-H-A-G. I don't think you pronounce it. It's not chag, hak. Hach, you know, it's kind of like that. Hach Samea that we say, happy feast. Now that word is about the Sabbath, but the, just about all the words about Sabbath is moed. In, in, in any case, if you think you can't fast and you want to teach that you shouldn't fast, take it up with Yeshua. He fasted 40 days. He fasted on at least five or six Sabbaths in a row. Right? We get these rules coming out. I hope you're finding me somewhere in the middle on a lot of these things. How far can you walk on the Sabbath? 
Are we going to go by the Jewish Sabbath day's journey, which is about three quarters of a mile? That's it? They allowed you to walk that far. But if you were over water, you were allowed to go further. So the rabbi said, so be over water, you can go further. So they would have this cart and they would, I'm not kidding, and they would have a bucket of water that they would put under their seat. So now they're over water and they can go further. See how ridiculous it gets after a while. Now, think though, if you were in the armies of Israel, going around the city of Jericho, on one day, they went seven times in one day, on the seventh day of the going around. Was that the Sabbath day? Was it some other day? Just one time around the whole city. I'll bet you it was more than three quarters of a mile. <laughs> so there's no statement. But on the Sabbath, let's not do this around the city thing. You see, I mean, even the Arabs, they fought the Yom Kippur War because they knew the Jews would be sleeping, resting. It was Yom Kippur. It was no work. You weren't even allowed to watch TV. You weren't allowed to see the news. But they fought. I'm glad they did. On the Sabbath. So again, the Sabbath was made for our benefit. Now, a more complicated one coming up. A couple more here. Exodus 35, 2 says, Keep the Sabbath. Verse 3, you don't even kindle a fire in your dwelling places on the Sabbath. Don't kindle a fire. Many translations say don't light a fire on the Sabbath day. The very super Orthodox Jews took that to mean that there should be no fire in the house. You can't tell me a loving God who has people in Alaska or any of the cold times anywhere in the world is going to tell that family, that head of family, no, I want your kids to freeze and you to freeze. So I believe that it's saying, kindle your fire on the sixth day. And yes, of course, you can keep it going on the Sabbath. Be prepared for that. There was a guy who was collecting sticks, firewood. He was put to death by, on God's orders because he was collecting firewood on the Sabbath. He hadn't prepared. He was treating it casually. He was profaning the Sabbath. But I, you know, remember again, the menorah had to be kept lit 24 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Remember, they had fire in the Holy Tabernacle offering the Sabbath sacrifices. So, I mean, understand, understand what this is all saying. I'm sure you could keep it going. It was a horrible story that in the very harsh Spanish Inquisition, what the Catholic Church would do is they would put people high up on the hills overlooking the cities, and any house that didn't have smoke coming out on the winter time, that had to be a Jew's house or a Christian's house who was a Sabbath keeper. And they pulled those people out and tortured them unless they changed over to Catholicism. I don't think God would keep us from being warm on the Sabbath. And lighting a fire was considerable work if you'd let the fire go out. So it was a nice gesture if you brought coals of fire, they'd carry them in this bundle on top of their head. It was a nice gesture if you'd bring that over to your friends who had, whose fire had gone out. What about cooking, baking, reheating, microwaving, or frying on the Sabbath? I already showed you that the priest replaced the bread, the showbread, baked it and refreshed it. Everything, everything in their history say it was hot when they put it in there every Sabbath. Certainly Sabbath is not a big day. We're doing, by the way, in lighting a fire and all that, we personally would not do a barbecue on the Sabbath. I know it's not that much work to get it going, and we just would not do that on the Sabbath. I know some big churches have had picnics on the Sabbath where maybe a dozen or more barbecues out there. We don't. I'm not going to condemn them. I just think we don't. Anyway, uh, certainly Sabbath is not a day to be cooking a great big roast. 
I, I'm pretty clear about that. Um, this will have to be your decision on this point. Probably most Church of God brethren do some light cooking on the Sabbath. Eggs, pancakes, oatmeal, that kind of thing. Um, we do our best to have cereal or uh, boiled eggs that were boiled before. Have those on Sabbath. I have many times, I have to be honest with you, had fried egg on the Sabbath. We're kind of looking at it all over now. Maybe, maybe we can just go for cereal and fruit, sandwiches, uh, salads. We do a lot of salads, a lot of sandwiches, very little cooking. And I'm thinking we're probably going to move towards no cooking on the Sabbath. I know our daughter does no cooking. But I know many of you other Sabbath keepers do. Uh, get your pizza ready. and You don't mind cold pizza. You don't mind uh, boiled eggs. You don't mind salads. You don't mind sandwiches. And then by end of Sabbath, have a wonderful cooked meal. That's fine. So, and then a lot of people will uh, heat things up on the Sabbath. How is that different from cooking? Or crock pot? microwaving, toasting. So anyway, this thing of cooking on the Sabbath, let me put one other thought out there. Cooking on the, on the Sabbath back in Moses' day compared to cooking on the Sabbath today where you can stick something in a microwave, hit one button, and you're done. Or turn one knob, and you're done preparing the fire, cooking, and all that. Uh, I, I'm really sometimes wondering especially considering the priests cooking, having sacrifices, lighting fires, keeping the menorah lights going. I'm really wondering if Yeshua today would say, no, no, no cooking, absolutely never. So I think most Church of God people do some light cooking on the Sabbath. Don't condemn them. Um, so cooking today certainly is a lot faster, a lot less hassle, hardly any work. What are you going to do with what you bring to potluck? It's going to be something cold every time? You could be. Just bring some sliced up watermelon or fruit or salads. But any potlucks of Church of God people I go to, it obviously is something that's hot and been cooking. So I think people take Exodus 16, bake what you will bake today, gather all this extra food on six day, Bake what you'll bake today, boil what you'll boil, leave the rest for the next day, leave the rest for the next day. I know some people look at that and say, that doesn't say you have to cook it all on the sixth day and eat it cold the next. It says, leave what you have for the next day. That's in Exodus 16. Forget the verse, around verse 23, I think, around there. Okay, I want to remind you again, Sabbath, make it fun for the kids. Make it fun. Order some Sabbath table games that they can, even all of you as a family. That's why I say if you're in church all day long and singing for two hours and then a sermon for an hour and a half and, and then prayer service and then a little own egg or potluck and then some more, it's too much. It's just too much. If you do that every single Sabbath, I don't think they're going to want to stay with the church. Many of them will leave at 18 or whatever, 17, 18. There are table games you can do on the Sabbath. There are walks you can do. Take the dog for a walk around the block. Go to the park. Have fun at the park. Enjoy creation. Here we take them to the park and we try to find a, an alligator. Oh, there's one. And we'll watch it. And then we'll feed... Um, the ducks or whatever. No, we're not supposed to do that, I guess. So we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so Sabbath is for us, remember. Put your mind to figuring out ways that can make it a joy, make it a delight, make it holy, make it a separate day, make it a day that's guarded, and one that is well within your own conscience. It must be holy. You don't want to be breaking God's law every single Sabbath. You must keep it holy. Set apart, sanctified. Okay? Understand what for you no work is. 
So we don't mow. We don't go shopping. Okay? We don't do dishes. We don't vacuum the house on Sabbath. We don't do any of that. Will we tidy up our dishes and stack them? Yeah. Yeah, we, sometimes we just use paper plates and chuck them. Just paper plates. That's all on Sabbath. No, no rinsing, no wiping off. We might wipe off a counter uh, so it's tidy. But again, we're not doing massive work. Some of you won't make your bed. We do. We do. We, we make the bed. How long? Especially when we do it together. What does it take? 30 seconds? And is that work? Work as defined, I believe, is work of your occupation or you're producing something. I don't think it means making your bed. Jesus said, pick up your bed. Pick up your mattress. Get out of here. Walk. So we make our bed. Yeah, we tidy things up here and there as needed. But, but we don't work in terms of doing our profession or mowing lawns and heavy work. Laundry, no, no. Ironing, no. Be ready for Sabbath. Have that all ready. I hope this has been helpful. Let's ask God's dismissal. Our Father in heaven, we come to you, and we come to Yeshua, our Father, as well. Yeshua, you're the Lord of the Sabbath. You made this. You know what a delight it should be. Father, please, please help us understand that Yeshua showed us, Jesus, you showed us exactly how ridiculous you thought some of the rules were back in that day. May we keep your Sabbath holy. Show us if I've said anything wrong, done anything wrong. Show me and I'll correct it as time goes on. But Father, we want to obey you. We want to please you. Yeshua, be our rest. Show us how to rest in you. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you. Bring Sabbath holiness back to your people. Yeshua, in your holy name, we pray. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.